Hello friends. To begin our discussion on the fifth Sunday of Lent, let us turn to our loving Father and pray. By your help we beseech you, Lord our God. May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which out of love for the world your Son handed himself over to death through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, on the fifth Sunday of Lent, our first reading taken from Prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 16 to 21, and then the responsible psalm taken from Psalm 126, the second reading, sent led to the Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 to 14 and in the gospel taken from John chapter 8 verses 1 to 11. All right friends, the fifth Sunday in Lent for ESC brings us to one of the most famous stories in all of the gospels. It is the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. So what is unique about this week, though, is the church takes the gospel for today, not from the gospel of Luke, which is what we have been reading uh, from throughout the ordinary time and through Lent up to this point, but from the gospel of John. This Sunday is from the gospel of John. So this is in John chapter 8 verse 1 to 11 and so we are going to look at this text and it is a good example of how the church will take very important passages from John and kind of scatter them throughout the three-year circle of gospel reading, especially during the season of Lent and Easter. So without any further ado, let us dive in and we will look at the gospel for today and then try to unpack very famous and actually in some ways kind of controversial text that is in John chapter 8 verse 1 to 11 we read these words. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrought with his fingers on the ground. And as they continued as him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrought with his fingers on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. Friends, it is a very interesting and also can be a very contra controversial gospel passage. So, what is going on in this passage? In this case, a few elements stand out as important. First, the context. 
Where does this happen? Well, this episode happens when Jesus is teaching in the temple in Jerusalem. And many of the episodes in the Gospel of John have that setting. So one of the difference between John and the Synoptic Gospel is that Matthew, Mark and Luke and the bulk of Jesus' teaching in those Gospels is either in Galilee, that is in the north or on the way to Jerusalem like in the Gospel of Luke. But in John's Gospel, a large number of Jesus' teaching are set in Jerusalem. And not just in Jerusalem, but in the temple. So this is a very public place. It's a place where our teachers and rabbis and scribes and Pharisees, they would gather to discuss the law and to teach, teach about the Torah. It was like, it was kind of like the Jewish uh, equivalent to Plato's Academy or the city of Athens or in the uh, Acropolis or in Greece where Greek philosophers and pagans uh, would gather to exchange ideas, to learn from one another, that kind of things. So Jesus is in the temple complex. He's teaching the Jewish people who are there in the temple and in that context, the Pharisees and the scribes bring before him a woman who has been caught in the act of adultery. Friends, let us pause there. One of the curious things about this is that although she's caught in the act, the man who is obviously guilty as well isn't brought onto the scene. So who was he? Where was he? Why wasn't he brought there before Jesus also? Well, we do not know. What we do know is that ancient Israel in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Numbers 5, there is a whole chapter dedicated to the suspect uh, adulterers and the, the test that would be given to a woman if she was suspected of adultery. So she would be brought into the temple and subject to a test if her husband suspects her of adultery. Now in this case, there is no test that is given because there isn't just a suspicion of adultery. She has been caught in the very act of adultery. So that fast forward her straight into the situation of having to deal with the penalty for adultery, which is in the law of Moses. The penalty for adultery is the death by stoning. Any first century Jew would have known this. However, because we have not first century Jews, I will just read the passage to you so that you are aware of the law. This will find, you will find this in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22 verses 22 to 24. It says, if a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lays, lies with the woman and the woman so shall purge the evil from Israel. And then it goes on to specify in verse 24, you shall stone them to death with stones. So, it specifies the manner of death is death by stoning. So in this case, any Jew would have known that adultery, meaning to have a relationship with someone else's spouse, is different from fornication, which would be to have a relations outside of the marital covenant. To have a relationship with the married man or married woman is to break one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not commit adultery. That is the Sixth Commandment. And in the Mosaic Law, a grave violation 
of any one of the Ten Commandments is punishable by death. So if you commit adultery, the punishment is death. If you blaspheme the holy name of God, the punishment is death. If you desecrate the Sabbath and work on Sabbath, the punishment is death. And if you uh, curse your father and mother, it is a capital crime. The punishment with death. And if you commit adultery, it is punishable by death. So if you uh, kidnap someone, in other words, commit grave theft, it is uh, punishable by death. So human trafficking would be a capital punishment crime in the Old Testament. And if you bear false witness in a murder case, the punishment is death. So I'm just trying to put it in the context here. The reason she's subject to death is because she has violated the one of the Ten Commandments and it is one of the few commandments where the kind of execution is specified in the Old Testament. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 22 says, you shall bring them out and, and stone them to death. Now notice friends, Deuteronomy envisions the execution of both the man and the woman. And in this case, all they have is the woman and that is who by bring before Jesus. That is who they bring before Jesus. And so now that you have got that background and you can understand what is happening here. So they say to Jesus, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? Now John tells us here that they are doing this to put Jesus to the test so that they might have a charge to bring against him. Now, in order to understand what that means, we need to be clear of the nature of the test. What kind of charge do they hope to bring against him? Well, essentially here, they are trying to entrap Jesus because they are putting him before, uh, putting, put, putting him between a rock and a hard place. So, on the one hand, if he says, don't stone her, let her go, he can be accused or charged of violating the law of Moses, which we just saw in Deuteronomy chapter 22, as well as in Leviticus chapter 20, which says that an adulteress or a woman guilty of adultery or a man is to be put to death. So if he says, let her go, don't stone her, he can be called a lawbreaker. On the other hand, if he says, stone her to death in the Jewish temple, in a very public place, he could also be accused of violating the Roman law. Because later on in the Gospel of John, especially chapter 18, verse 31, you might recall, Pilate taunts the, the Jewish leaders and say, take him yourself and judge him according to your our own law and the Jews said it is not lawful for us to put any man to death now they don't mean it is not in accordance with the law of Moses they mean it's not in accordance with the Roman law because the Roman law took away the authority of the Jewish leaders to execute anyone so they don't have a court that can try capital cases. Those have to be brought before the Roman uh, procurator for the Roman governor, uh, Pontius Pilate, in this case. So if Jesus says stone her, then these same Pharisees and scribes could then charge Jesus with having initiated an execution which it was unlawful for a Jew to do, which for a 
prominent Jewish rabbi and leader like Jesus could get him in trouble and put him to the prison. So if you see there, there are two situations here. Either he gets in trouble with the Jewish authorities for being a breaker of the Mosaic law, or he can get in trouble with the Roman authorities for breaking the Roman law. And so they think that they have caught him. And they think they have got him. Now, just a basic rule of thumbs. Don't try to trap Jesus of Nazareth. Don't try to put him in a situation because what is going to happen? And if you try to entrap him, is that the trap that you set is going to spring back upon you. And so you will see this happen in various situations in the gospel where people try to storm Jesus with a hard question or they put him to the test or in this case they try to actually set up a situation where he can be charged with the crime. So they set the trap and it springs back in their own face in a couple of ways. How? First, notice Jesus responds to them by writing in the dirt. Now, that is a weird response, but John's really clear that Jesus responds by bending down and writing with his fingers on the ground. And John tells us this, people usually miss this, that Jesus did it twice. So he's actually emphasizing it. So it is a gesture that is meant to be called attention to. It means to draw our attention and yet at the same time it is strange. So what is Jesus doing writing in the dirt? Well, you can imagine. Over the centuries, commentators have gone wild <laughs> trying to figure it out. What is Jesus doing? What is he writing in the dirt? Why? And again, you have probably heard preachers or homilies speculate about this. Some people will say that Jesus wrote the sins of the scribes and Pharisees in the dirt and they saw their sins being listed in the sand. They were kind of moved to repentance and they left in shame. So that is a very popular explanation of it. Others will say that he was just ignoring the scribes and Pharisees kind of doodling on the ground. Uh, that is one possibility as well. So if you look at the history of interpretation, there are kind of three major explanations. First, some people just say that it is a sign of indifference. In other words, it's just basically snubbing the scribes and Pharisees. That is one possibility. And the second one is that he writes the sins of the accusers in the dirt that actually goes all uh, the way uh, back to St. Jerome. Interestingly though, I just learned that as I was researching for this explanation, it is fascinating. So in Jerome's book against uh, Pelagius, he speculate that might be what had happened. And, but the most popular explanation, the one that is taken actually not just by uh, St. Ambrose, even but by St. Augustine himself, as well as more recent Catholic biblical scholars, is that Jesus here is performing a sign that is a fulfillment of prophecy. So if you go back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, there is a passage in the Old Testament that actually talks about writing in the dirt and it's going and it. It's got a couple of uh, striking parallel with the Gospel of John. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1 and 13, 
we hear these words the sin of judah is written with a pen of iron and that verse friends verse 1 if you skip down to verse 13 this is the main verse it says o lord the hope of israel all who forsake thee shall be put to shame those who turn away from thee shall be written in the earth for they have forsaken the lord the fountain of living water all right friends let us pause there in its original context what prophet jeremiah is basically describing is that the name of those who forsake the god of israel who have abandoned him they are going to be written in the dirt as a kind of sign of condemnation like a sign of judgment upon them because they have forsaken the fountain of living water referring to the lord now in the light of that prophecy if you fast forward to the new testament it's really fascinating in john chapter 8 jesus is writing in the dirt by saying let who is without sin cast the first stone and then in john chapter 7 but as Jesus identified himself as the fountain of living water. He says, out of his heart shall flow river of flowing water. So when you think of the image of sin being written in the dirt and the fountain of living water being rejected by the elders or, or the leaders of Judah, the leaders of Israel, some scholars have suggested that what Jesus is doing is basically performing a sign of judgment against the leaders in Jerusalem, the scribes and the Pharisees who have rejected him, the fountain of living water. So that their sin is being written in the earth as a judgment against them, as a condemnation of them. So it is, in a way, friends, a riddle. It's a prophecy that puts the scribes and Pharisees in the role of the sinful leaders of Judah that Jeremiah had prophesied against in the Old Testament. And when they see the sign performed in the light of that prophecy, they are convicted and it says that each one of them, beginning with the elders, walks away and leaves Jesus and the woman alone. So that is the third explanation for it. A kind of prophetic sign which Jesus does all the time in the Gospels. And that is the one I am most inclined to. And that is the inter interpretation of St. Augustine. In any case, what matters for us is Jesus springs the trap on them. They are unable to push him, force him into either letting the woman go or authorizing, the, or authorizing her to being stoned and then getting in trouble with the Roman authorities. So now there is one other aspect of this that I would just highlight real quick as the side note which is this often dear friends people as when you are teaching or when you are discussing about the different bible passages question like this doesn't jesus break the law in doing that if the law of deuteronomy chapter 20, 22 says that she was to be stoned. Isn't Jesus breaking the law by not stoning her? Well, what is interesting is in the book of Deuteronomy, especially chapter 17, verse 6, it also says that no one shall be put to death on the testimony of just one witness. You have to have the testimony of 
203 witnesses in Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 6. So what happens in John chapter 8 is that all of the witnesses depart. And so when Jesus looks up from writing in the desert, what does he say to the woman? Has no one condemned you? Everyone is left and no one is testified against her. All that are left are he and the woman. So it's just him and her. And so she says, well, no one's Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and don't sin again. Friends, I'm speculating a little bit here. But I think it is interesting at least that Jesus creates a situation where they actually aren't to witness to testify against her, which is what would be the necessary in the law for someone to be put to death. So even here, by springing the trap, he is faithful to the Mosaic law. In other words, it would be a violation of the Mosaic law for him to pick up a stone and put her to death just with one person. That would break the law. So you had to have two public witnesses to testify. If you want any analogy of this, remember at the trial of Sanhedrin, they are trying to dump up two witnesses to testify that Jesus said that he would destroy the temple because they can't put him to death if you don't have at least two people willing, willingly to publicly charge him with a crime. And that is what happened. That is what doesn't happen here with the woman. So he says to her, neither do I condemn you. And then his final words, so important, go and sin no more. So he calls her to repent, to change her life, to turn away from her life to adultery and do not commit that sin again. So friends, it's the beautiful, beautiful story of divine mercy. And also the call to change one's life from a life of sin. All right, friends, with that mind, let us go back to the Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading for today is not from Jeremiah 17, the passage that I read to you as prophecy, because we are in the land and the Old Testament texts are about salvation history, as I mentioned last week even. So in this case, the church gives us a prophecy from the book of Isaiah chapter 43 verse 16 and following. This passage is about the new exodus. So in a previous reading from Len, we heard about the first exodus from Egypt in the time of Moses and to entry into the promised land. So this is a prophecy that looks forward to a new exodus. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariots and hosts, army and warriors. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are exti extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former thing, nor consider things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way into the, in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, that they might declare my praise. So what is God talking about? He said, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to inaugurate a new exodus. I'm going to make a new way in the wilderness. And I'm going to give a new springs of water in the wilderness. And this is not 
going to be an earthly exodus and an earthly journey to the to an earthly promised land with earthly water to sustain or uh, sustain our earthly thirst in the Sinai desert. It is the new exodus of Jesus Christ that is going to be a supernatural journey through the waters of baptism to the heavenly promised land of the new Jerusalem. So that is this final prophecy that the church gives us in the fifth Sunday of Lent as we are looking forward to the exodus that Jesus is going to accomplish in Jerusalem through his passion, death and resurrection. Friends, in closing for today, I would just like to end with a quote from St. Augustine. He wrote a very beautiful series of homilies on the Gospel of John. And all the story of the woman caught in adultery is missing from some ancient Greek copies of John's Gospel is not missing. Or at least it wasn't missing from St. John's ancient Latin copy of the Gospel. So we are blessed to have one of his homilies on this. Uh, one of the things Augustine wrestles with in his homily is the question of is God condoning the sin of the adulteress by not having her put to death? Isn't God being a little too lenient here with what is obviously a very serious sin? Because Adultery is a grave sin. It's not only violate the Ten Commandments, it breaks the marital covenant, it destroys families, it destroys homes. Think of all the human pains and suffering and tears and heartaches and children who have been hurt by the sin of adultery. So this is a very serious sin. So how can Jesus just let the woman go and say, Go and sin no more. So what do we make of this act of our Lord? So St. Augustine looks at this passage that actually scandalizes some Christians. And this is what he said about Jesus' response to the uh, woman caught in adultery. Look at the way our Lord's answer upheld justice without forging clemency. Of foregoing clemency. He was not caught in the scare his enemies and had laid for him. It is they themselves who were caught in it. They did not say the woman should not be stoned, for then it would look as though he were opposing the law, but had no intention of saying, Let her be stoned, because he came not to destroy those he found but to see those who were lost. Mark is replied. It contains justice, clemency and truth in full measure. What is this? Lord, are you going to approve this immorality? Not at all. Take note of what follows. Go and sin no more. You see the, you see that the Lord does indeed Past sentence, but it is sin he condemns, not people. One who would have approved of immorality would have said, Neither will I condemn you. Go and live as you please. You can be sure that I will acquit you. However, much you sin, I will release you from all penalty and from the tortures of hell and the underworld. He did not say that. He said, neither will I condemn you. You need have no fear of the past, but be aware of what you do in the future. Neither will I condemn you. I have blotted out what you have done. Now observe what I have commanded in order to obtain what I have promised. That is a quote from St. Augustine. Well, friends, I will just say, especially to all those catechumens coming into the church at the Easter time, remember this. 
what is past is past. The Lord does not condemn you for what you have done. Now go, sin no more and live a new life in Christ. Either through the waters of baptism for those who are coming into the church or through the grace of confession for those of us who are in it. Let us enter into the Easter season turning away from sin and turning our hearts and our minds to God. Friends, our God is a God of second chance. Let us turn to Him and humbly acknowledge our unworthiness, our sinfulness, confess our sins and receive His mercy for our soul in order to live a life that He promised, life of abundance. Jesus said, I have come so that you will have life, life in abundance. May the Lord bless you and fill you with peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See you on Sunday. God loves you all.